In the beginning, part five, the origins of Genesis reconsidered. We've been going through the book uh, uh, in the beginning, uh, full title, Science and Scripture Confirm Creation. That's the cover. It's edited by Brian W. Ball, who also wrote this particular chapter, um, along with the first one that we studied. Um, he was born in Devon, England, got his master's in religion from Andrews, got his PhD from the University of London, has been a church pastor, evangelist, conference president, uh, principal of Avondale College, and then finally president of the South Pacific Division. And uh, he notes in his uh, thumbnail biography that he's married to Don Ball, and they have three children. The uh, book itself is written from a perspective that views scripture as decisive. As the uh, introduction says, its authority takes precedence over all of the sources of information concerning origins. Uh, the book is mostly, therefore, about theology because they feel that if you establish the correct theology, uh, you've pretty well got it. Um, it does have uh, sections on theology, evidence of faithful transmission of the text, arguments against higher criticism, and a for a view consonant with Jesus and the New Testament. Uh, it does also include scientific chapters by Tim Standish, Grenville Kent, John Walton, James Gibson, and our own Ariel Roth. Its uh, uh, final two chapters deal with theistic evolution and with evolutionary morality. This particular chapter is about how did Genesis get written, as it's entitled, The Origins of Genesis Reconsidered. Why well, reconsidered? Because it has been considered before and thought to be a rather late work. And uh, Brian Ball is going to argue that no, it's actually very early work. He starts out, Genesis, we are frequently reminded, is the book of origins. It sets before us the beginnings of the world and of humankind, of life and death, sin and the first promises of salvation, the Sabbath and marriage, society, civilization, and through the stories of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the beginnings of God's chosen people, Israel. Uh, you'll notice that that's been some of the themes of the last two chapters we've talked about, which discuss the theology of Genesis, which is, as they note also, Genesis is the foundation upon which the rest of the Bible is built, and as many have correctly claimed, it is an essential cornerstone of historic Christian theology. There is, as one Genesis specialist remarks, no work known to us from the ancient Near East that is remotely comparable in scope. And then he asked these questions. But what of the origin of Genesis itself? Where did it come from? Who wrote it? Where was, when was it written? Is it the work of one author or many? Is the Genesis text reliable? Is it to be understood literally and historically, or as many would claim today, is it largely a myth that must be demythologized in order to be understood? And are the first 11 chapters of an entirely different genre from the rest of the book, resulting in a dichotomy rather than a unity? These are all important questions, not only for the book of Genesis itself, but also for the rest of the Bible, and few more crucial than those of origin and historicity. Now, a little uh, aside here. Last week, uh, somebody was asking, well, which part of this came from uh, uh, the book itself and which part came from me, and so I've tried to make it a little more clear. When you see yellow type, that means that those are my additions. The white actually came from the book itself, although there'll be little snatches sometimes, but I've tried to be as fair as possible doing this kind of Reader's Digest condensation of the chapter. The traditional belief was that Moses wrote Genesis oh, around 1445 BC. Um, the author opts for just a little bit earlier than 1445 BC along with the Seventh-day Adventist Bible commentary. The book doesn't say, and probably with good reason, who wrote it. And we'll see what uh, that means later on. The sources um, again, quoting the book, we're as ancient to Moses as he is to us. 
Now, I would say that's not quite maybe true, depending on what the exact chronology was, but it's very close. And then the book asks, is it really feasible to think that all the information in Genesis had been handed down orally without loss or corruption through countless generations? I'm omitting some of the flowery asides that get put in, which are fine if you're reading it and you've got lots of time. Or could there be written sources? The uh, book then outlines a theory that's been around well, since at least the 1800s. Um, it goes by the name of the graf Wellhausen theory, or the documentary hypothesis. And it quickly came to dominate Old Testament scholarship. Um, some of the critics, w uh, one of the critics of this theory was a gentleman by the name of P.J. Weissman. Um, he proposed that Genesis had originally been written on tablets. And uh, we're going to get to his theory in some detail in just a little bit. He then said that Moses had compiled Genesis from these texts. In this essay, we shall attempt to explain the tablet theory with sufficient detail to convey the strength of its arguments and demonstrate how many of its main features are supported by archaeological evidence and by other biblical scholars and ancient Near, East, Near Eastern specialists. Um, and uh, some of the people who support this are D.J. Weissman, uh, 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 the other Weissman's son, uh, R.K. Harrison, and interestingly enough, somebody that is often put in the camp of the documentary hypothesis but really doesn't belong there. And the reason why is because, uh, that's not Jean, it's Jean, asterisk, pardon my French. <coughs> But Jean Astrick, who was incidentally a physician, proposed that Moses used sources. And um, the documentary hypothesis people will sometimes claim him as an ancestor of theirs because they're saying, well, yes, um, there were sources, but they were late. And see, first you had to establish that Moses had sources. He didn't just write it up out of whole cloth. And then, uh, uh, but Moses uh, having sources actually fits better with, uh, that's a P.E., I think it is, Weissman, P.J. Weissman. Um, uh, uh, than, uh, than it does with the, the standard documentary hypothesis. Weissman's uh, tablet theory originated in part from his own profound misgivings concerning the documentary hypothesis. And at a time when that hypothesis dominated Old Testament scholarship in general and the origins of Genesis in particular, he regarded it as misconceived, unenlightened, a series of suggestions already, in his opinion, obsolete on the account of substantial archaeological discoveries in the ancient Near East, not the least of which was the discovery of writing itself that went back a long ways. Uh, Genesis was divided into the J, E, and P theories, with later theorists adding D, L, and R. And I would add, there's, it turns out that there are several redactors that finally get in on the act, including uh, the one that combined J and E and the one that combined uh, uh, J, E, and P. Deuteronomy is its own whole cloth thing. And the subsequent origins of Genesis, or parts of it, as late as the 6th century BC. And in fact, there were some of them that put it in the 5th century BC, with Ezra being one of the main, or somebody close to Ezra being one of the main uh, redactors at the end. According to one critic, the stories of the patriarchs were sagas or legends, Genesis containing no historical knowledge about the patriarchs. That is, of course, one higher critic, one person opposed to uh, P.J. Weissman's idea and uh, in favor of the documentary hypothesis. <coughs> 
Uh, K.A. Kitchen has a comment that uh, the book quotes that he says it's, it's hard but not unfair. During the later 19th century, rationalistic Old Testament scholarship in Germany decided that the Old Testament accounts of Hebrew history did not fit, quote, history, end quote, as it, quote, should, end quote, have happened, according to their preconceived ideas. Therefore, its leading representatives rearranged the Old Testament writings until Old Testament history, religion, and literature had been suitably manipulated to fit in with their philosophical preconceptions. He goes on to say, yet uh, up to now no one knows who J, E, or E, or P really were, or even if they or their documents ever existed. Although there were some people that hypothesized that P was actually uh, uh, Ezra or somebody close to him. Astonishing as it may seem, not one document or fragment has ever been discovered. J, E, and P are all purely hypothetical. Uh, since the 1970s and 1980s, opposition to the documentary hypothesis has grown. Rensberg, in his study of Genesis, concluding that it is, quote, untenable, end quote, end quote, should be discarded, end quote. I might add that there's a book out called Who Wrote the Bible that partially deconstructs the documentary hypothesis as well, although he adopts a kind of a modified documentary hypothesis. Um, fundamental to an understanding of the graph of Alhausen theory is the fact that its development coincided with the rise and spread of Darwinism. Um, according to R.K. Harrison, pointing out that Valhausen himself held, quote, evolutionary concepts characteristic of the philosophy of Hegel, end quote, Harrison reminds us that the intellectual climate of the time was dominated by theories of evolution and that Wellhausen's theory itself, quote, bore all the marks of Hegelian evolutionism, end quote, and revealed quote, a, quote, completely unwarranted confidence in the evolutionary zeitgeist, end quote. In fact, the line is closer than that. The full name of the graph Wellhausen hypothesis is the Fatke graph kunin wellhausen hypothesis. And uh, Fatke was, in fact, a pupil of Hegel. And when he wrote his first little thing, uh, his first little uh, note that got the hypothesis started, uh, the uh, first half of his book was, uh, was uh, simply philosophical considerations based on Hegel. So, I mean, it's very firmly Hegelian. Wellhausen, the critical rationalism he had embraced so readily in his earlier years, had made havoc of his own faith in the authority and authenticity of the Old Testament. Now, it's not clear from the quote, and I eventually I'd like to go back and, and look at what it had to say, whether Wellhausen felt that this was a bug or a feature. And uh, uh, for many people, it was, in fact, a feature. It got rid of all those miraculous uh, elements of the Old Testament that they didn't really like because of the zeitgeist of the time. K.A. Kitchen uh, comments, the most ardent adv advocate of the documentary theory must admit that we have as yet no single scrap of external objective evidence for either the existence or the history of J, E, or any other alleged source document. The theory was developed and promulgated in almost total ignorance of the ancient Near East and its long literary tradition and literary customs. Uh, Weissman, the uh, documentary hypothesis quote, originated in an age of ignorance concerning the earliest pra patriarchal times. Uh, uh, the person who took apart the documentary hypothesis first, it's fascinating to read the Wikipedia on him because uh, it, it describes what he did and then there's a note saying, uh, well, this isn't really objective. <laughs> because if it were objective, of course, it would be more favorable to the uh, 
standard model. <coughs> but anyway, Umberto Casuto wrote uh, uh, the documentary hypothesis and the composition of the Pentateuch. A little note on Casuto, he uh, lived uh, during the rise of Mussolini and uh, in, Ital in Italy. He was a, a Jewish scholar and then um, to escape Mussolini moved down to the Hebrew University in Jerusalem, which was there before uh, Palestine was separated into uh, the Jewish state and the uh, uh, other states that uh, now compose it. Um, and the translator has this comment on Casuto's um, uh, book. Uh, Casuto, quote, examines the basic arguments of the prevailing higher critical view one by one and proceeds to re rebut them with compelling logic supported by profound learning. Casuda's work precipitated, this is uh, uh, back to Dr. Ball again, Casuda's work precipitated the beginning of the end for the documentary hypothesis. And although the end may not have yet arrived, many contemporary Old Testament scholars admit that the documentary hypothesis is now passé. Uh, for one thing, everybody knows the priestly code came before Deuteronomy. Uh, well, almost everybody. There are some people that got trained 40 years ago and still haven't figured that out. But, you know, those people are there in every uh, realm of study. Um, indeed, with the decline of the documentary hypothesis, one even speaks of the present methodological crisis in Genesis studies. Although it remains to be seen just how that crisis will be resolved, the tablet theory, with its recognition of the importance of both archaeological evidence and the Genesis text itself, must at least merit consideration as a legitimate explanation of the book's origins. It will be prudent at the same time to remember that Weissman's theory is rejected a priori by many modern scholars who still cling forlornly to the documentary hypothesis, including some who would otherwise be thought of as conservative. Weisman proposed that uh, the book of Genesis was originally written on tablets in the ancient script of the time by the patriarchs who were intimately concerned with the events related and whose names are clearly stated. Moreover, Moses, the compiler and editor of the book, as we now have it, plainly directs attention to the source of his information. A uh, little background to this uh, whole thing, over 500,000 tablets have been discovered, most of which are over 4,000 years old. That's, that is, they go back to 2000 BC and beyond. That's before the time of Moses. The lack of this knowledge had led to major errors in the documentary hypothesis. One of the foundations of the documentary hypothesis to begin with from all the reading I have been able to find is that uh, Moses couldn't have written the Pentateuch because writing hadn't been invented by then. And that's, of course, now known to be complete uh, balderdash. There is in the documentary hypothesis that civilization had developed gradually and appeared late in history uh, that the late development and use of writing, uh, that there was no understanding of ancient literary customs and procedures uh, in the people who wrote the documentary hypothesis or, or produced it, and um, the imposition of unfounded theories on the Genesis text. And uh, some of those theories have to do with um, a Hegelian evolution that uh, things could only happen in certain ways and uh, therefore you couldn't take the text seriously. As a corrective to these errors, Weissman argued that the cuneiform literature revealed, one, the antiquity of civilization. It went back far enough to believe that there were cities back then, etc. That the, the writing had developed very early um, and in fact, uh, he doesn't mention it, but alphabetic writing was invented by the time Moses wrote the, uh, uh, wrote the Pentateuch. And 
depending on what you do with history, Moses may have even participated in inventing that uh, system of writing. But that's a story for another day. Uh, the need to understand ancient literary customs. You have to understand how they wrote in order to look at their product and understand what they're saying. And the genesis would be understood in the light of ancient literary practices that had prevailed during the times of the patriarchs. In Genesis 5.1, Safer, or sometimes written Safer, uh, pronounced the same way, of course, the original word translated in the text as book, which we still use in Hebrew as, uh, for book, designates only an inscribed text. In other words, it's not particular whether it uh, is written on paper or parchment or vellum or, or uh, clay tablets. If it's written, it's written, and it's something you can carry around. And uh, for those who are a bit foggy in the memory, uh, Genesis 5.1 is, this is the book of the generations of Adam. It's telling you right there, this is a written document in the day that the God created man in the likeness of man, God made he him, and then it goes on. Weissman said, it was confidently expected that excavation would support the widely held view of a gradual development of civilization. But the cumulative evidence to the contrary has grown to sub such substantial proportions that it seems that soon after the flood, civilization reached a peak from which it was to recede. Instead of the infinitely slow development anticipated, it has become obvious that art and, we may say, science suddenly burst upon the world. Uh, there's something interesting about this. Uh, the same phenomenon has occurred in, um, in uh, North America with the uh, uh, original Americans. Um, all of a sudden, for no obvious reason, uh, civilization seems to have just blossomed forth with the Anastasi. Uh, and at one time, the largest apartment building in the world was in North America, built by what are commonly called the Indians. Kind of interesting. Just came out of nowhere. Uh, civilization doesn't take nearly as long to make as the, uh, as the Hegelians would have you believe. H.R. Hall goes on to say, when civilization appears, it is already full grown, and Sumerian culture springs into view ready-made. Uh, Kitchen says, by 2000 BC, the civilized world was already ancient. It is now widely recognized that civilization is considerably older than had, has been widely believed under the influence of evolutionary theory. Uh, there are written records that go back to 3,500 B.C. That, of course, is a conventional dating, and uh, uh, I wouldn't uh, put too hard numbers on it, but what it is is it goes back to as far as civilization goes back, certainly. Um, the cuneiform literature reveals that ancient scribes used certain literary devices, notably in connecting successive tablets in a series. There are two such practices, the use of catch lines and colophons, which it is necessary to understand. A catch line was a sentence or phrase from the last line of a tablet that was repeated at the beginning of the next tablet to ensure continuity and if a series of tablets became disordered, to enable the reader to rearrange them correctly. Sometimes the catch line could be the title of the document, in this case usually the first few words of the opening tablet. And for those of you in interested, Enuma Elish's went on high, that's the first two words of the uh, creation epic in Sumeria. And as a matter of fact, our Hebrew Genesis, the, the name for that in Hebrew is Bereshith, which of course is the very first word in Genesis, in the beginning. And uh, the same thing is true for um, Shemoth, uh, is, uh, I think, the first or second word of uh, these are the names. 
Uh, I believe that's numbers. I have to, I have forgotten. Uh, Bamidbar, I know, is uh, in the wilderness. Um, but all of them are just, they take one of the words in the front of the book and they use it as the title. So that's, that's standard even for, uh, for the uh, biblical record as well. Sometimes a numbering system was added. Um, in his study of the Babylonian Genesis, Alexander Heidel examined the contents of the now well-known Babylonian creation epic, Enuma Elish, dating from the early second millennium BC, which had been written on a series of seven tablets. Conventional age, by the way, older than Moses. Um, noting the catch lines as they appeared on successive tablets. It is one of the many examples that could be cited. We can perhaps compare catch lines to the running heads and page numbers of a modern book. You know, where the chapter, uh, in the chapter will say, you know, in the garden or something like that on the top of every page. And um, it'll be the title. Uh, the other frequently used literary device in ancient literature was the colophon. A colophon was the concluding statement of a document, and it normally included the name of the scribe or owner of the tablet, not always the same person, and frequently a reference to the time of composition. Thus, the colophon took the place of the title page in a modern book, but appeared at the end of the document rather than at the beginning. This writer, uh, Ball is persuaded that Wiseman con conclusively proved his case. Toledo, these are the generations of, and Ganesius says it's better translated history of. Um, uh, generations, <laughs> actually there's a Hebrew word for generations and it's door. Uh, it marks a tablet, it occurs at the end of the tablet, and Harrison's table follows. Um, tablet one, finishes in Genesis 2, 4, and it's the origin of the cosmos. These are the generations of the heavens and the earth. And then um, tablet 2 goes to chapter 5, verse 2, is, and it's the origin of mankind. We just looked at uh, chapter 1. This is, this is the book of the generations of Adam. Um, Adam, of course, meaning man, as well as meaning a particular man. Um, chapter 3 uh, ends at 6-9, and it's the history of Noah. This is the generations of Noah, only it's really the history of Noah. And uh, tablet 4 ends in 10-1, it's the history of Noah's sons. Tablet 5 is Genesis, goes to Genesis 11-10, and it's the history of Shem. Tablet 6 goes to um, the history, uh, 1127, it's the history of Tira. Uh, in fact, this one is probably worth stopping for just a minute on. Uh, uh, do, uh, Ball doesn't do this, but I'll, I'll do it for him. Uh, the history of Tira, and then it says, Tira begat Abraham and Nahor and, and Haran, and you never hear another word about Hera, uh, Tira. It's not the history about Tira. The history of Tira is the history that Tira had that had his ancestors and came down to him. And in fact, in that verse, you'll notice that it does, uh, and Tira begat Nah, uh, Abram, Nahor, and Haran. And then it says, this is the history of Tira. And then it goes on to say, Tira begat a Abram, Nahor, and Haran. That's one of those catchphrases that you that you run across. Um, the history of Ishmael goes all the way to, to 25, uh, 12. Uh, that's uh, tablet 7, tablet 8. It goes from 25, 13 to 25, 19, the history of Isaac. Tablet 9 uh, goes to um, Genesis 36, 1, and that's the history of Esau. Tablet 10 is another history of Esau. And tablet 11, which ends at uh, 37 2, is the history of Jacob. And again, the history of Jacob was before all that the history of 
that it starts then is the history actually of Joseph. So it's not the story about Jacob, it's the story that Jacob, it's Jacob's tablet, if you like. Wiseman contends that the name recorded at the end of the phrase on each occasion it is used refers to the owner or writer of the tablet rather than to the history of the person named. And I've just outlined one of the reasons why. Wiseman and Harrison agree that Moses did not compose Genesis, but that he compiled it from a series of ancient tablets recorded as primeval and patriarchal history developed. <coughs> that is why nowhere in the Bible, let alone in Genesis itself, is it claimed that Moses was the author of the book. If the tablet theory is correct, we would expect to find that the evidence of its great age in the text of those early, that evidence, of its great age in the text of those early chapters. Weisman presents several lines of evidence. First, the presence of Babylonian words in the first 11 chapters. Those were the ones that came from Ur of the Chaldees. Um, two, the use of Egyptian words and references to Egyptian customs in the latter chapters, because that's where those stories took place. Three, references to towns and places that either had ceased to exist or whose original names were already ancient by Moses' time. And four, catch lines in the text. Uh, the book has a short paragraph on the first two, uh, on each of the first two, and I'm going to omit that, but I'm going to spend a little more time on numbers three and four. Genesis 14, there's the story of Abram and the... Uh, and the invasion of uh, Sodom from uh, up north in uh, Mesopotamia. And uh, uh, it talks about Bela, the same as Zoar. You have to explain to the reader what uh, Bela really is. The Vale of Siddim, well now that's the Salt Sea. But at one time it was just a valley, it wasn't full. And Mishpat, which is Kadesh. Oba, which is on the left hand of Damascus. By the time Moses is writing this, nobody knows where Hobah is. And finally, in Genesis 23.2, Sarah died in Kiriath Arba with the explanation, the same as Hebron in the land of Canaan. Now, not only was the name by which the place was known in Moses' day recorded, but it is also necessary to state that Hebron was in Canaan. Weissman comments, this surely indicates that the note was added at a very early date before the children of Israel had entered the land. No one in later times would need to be told where Hebron was. And then we come to the number four, the, the catch lines. One of them is God created the heavens and the earth and then the Lord God made the heavens and the earth. Almost identical phrasing. Uh, at the beginning and in, at the end, and then when they were created, and the Lord God made the heavens and the earth also reappears in 5.2 as well, when they were created. Um, 6.10, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, 10.1, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, so you have stuff at the beginning and the end of tablets as well. After the flood, after the flood, and then there's a couple of them here. Abram, Nehor, and Haran, and you'll notice that those ones are right next to each other on either side of a, this is the generations of. This is more of a, a traditional catchphrase that you'll find. Um, Abraham's son, Abraham's son, again, uh, a few verses apart, so it's not quite as striking as the Abraham, Nehor, and Haran. Who is Edom? Who is Edom? And then father of the Edomites, and uh, or literally father of Edom, and again that's repeated twice. The table of nations in Genesis 10, the text of Genesis 10 is in little doubt since it is essentially confirmed in 1 Chronicles 4, 1, 4 through 20, uh, 23. Um, Hamilton says it was the building of the city and not the tower per se that provoked the divine displeasure. This is uh, the Tower of Babel story. And he goes on to say, be that as it may, apparently that's, uh, he's not going to spend too much time arguing about that particular point. Um, 
And finally, there is the Sumerian king list, which is fascinating because there are 10 antediluvian kings. They, by the way, the names don't match the 10 uh, Hebrew pa patriarchs. Um, and there is a tradition of 10 uh, antediluvian kings also in Barossus, which uh, uh, Dr. Ball mentions. The arguments, the reasoning, the evidence from archaeology and from the Genesis text itself, the gaping flaws in the discredited documentary hypothesis, and the unity the proposal brings back to the frequently dissected book of Genesis, all combine to call for, uh, uh, that's my typo, the careful reading and objective evaluation of Weissman's tablet theory. It also illuminates our understanding of the process of revelation and inspiration, well, for various reasons, including the lingering influence of the documentary hypothesis. Uh, the thesis has until now remained a minority viewpoint. It should not be forgotten that objectivity and the continuing quest for truth do not allow an arbitrary rejection of any proposal if the arguments and the evidence are sufficiently compelling or if they lead to greater understanding. Now, my take on that is I mostly agree with uh, Dr. Ball, and uh, in fact, very close to completely. Um, the defense of the scriptural story of Genesis in his book, this is where it fits. There is such a thing as propositional revelation, which is his first uh, chapter. The text is reliable. The word speaks for itself. You can understand it. Uh, Genesis is theologically sound. The two chapters arguing Genesis is ancient. This is his chapter. Um, Genesis describes a recent creation, which is the one we'll discuss next week. Uh, creation and biblical theology are mutually supportive. Uh, the New Testament supports the Genesis creation. Uh, creation is more compatible with Jesus than evolution. And then there follow the scientific arguments, the ethics chapter and the theistic evolution chapter. Uh, although some catch lines are obvious, I think others are not so obvious, and this is where I'm, you know, getting a little, uh, 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 I, I think that it's very possible that Moses didn't simply compile, but that he actually edited and that some of those extra things got taken or moved around or, or something like that. Um, there is a problem with the theory in that, that there's no tablet for Abraham where you would expect to find one. There is no tablet for, uh, uh, there is a long one for Ishmael, a very short one for Isaac, a long one for Edom, a short one for Edom, and then a short one for Jacob. And I can't help but thinking that perhaps some of the history actually come through, came through uh, Jacob as well as through Esau and that you're seeing uh, uh, some tablets being put together in an, uh, a very artful way. The tablets are unequal in size, and uh, a small amount of inequality is understandable, but uh, uh, the great deal of inequality suggests to me that at least some of the tablets have been uh, uh, combined in a way where we've lost some of the markers. Um, and whenever you start proposing that uh, there were modifications along the way, obviously your theory becomes less predictive, although uh, it may very well be more accurate, even though it's less precise. Um, but be, but uh, given those facts, I think the theory is very attractive. It has independent evidence for it in a number of different ways, both from the customs of ancient scholars and from uh, the fact that it fits the, uh, uh, the uh, outside evidence better. The uh, other stories that are out there. Uh, it explains the primary evidence for the documentary hypothesis. This is really important. The documentary hypothesis really pounded the table on two points. One, Genesis 2 is a different story from Genesis 1. And two, the flood account has two or three different narratives woven together. Those of us who've been here, I think, uh, a few months ago may remember Brian uh, Bull pointing out that uh, 
it looks obvious to him that there are two or three counts. Well, this is the one tablet that says it's got three authors. So maybe there were three, two or three accounts that were woven together. If the story is true, and this is important, if we go and say, well, yeah, that yeah, sounds pretty good. Well, let's see where we go with it. That means that Genesis 1, meaning Genesis 1 to Genesis 2, 4a, is actually from either the mouth or the hand of God. God's the only person who could have said this. That, you know, Genesis 2 is from Adam. Genesis 1 is from the hand of God. This explains why it is so polished, and it's, uh, it's an easy read, and it's an interesting read. Um, the documentary hypothesis totally flubs this. And the reason why is because the documentary hypothesis originally put this with E, because it uses the term Elohim. That's what one of the things that E stood for, that in Ephraim, um, where it was supposed to have been composed. But as the hypothesis got further uh, explained, they had to put it in P because the theology was so advanced. It is the best theology of virtually any part of the Pentateuch. So it must have been the latest because that's how things happen. Theology gradually developed over time. Well, the problem is if you read the rest of P, it is, at least for the Westerner, I have to confess, the, um, the Hebrews really love to read Leviticus. When I was reading my Bible, I could just barely get through Leviticus. I mean, there, yeah, it's interesting. There's all those laws, all the details, all the pedantic stuff, all of, you know. Um, of course, you know, if it's your relatives, then, <laughs> then it gets more interesting. But... The story, of the, um, the story of creation is totally out of character compared with that. And yet they have to put it in the same place because of theology. What it suggests is God's a really good writer. Um, and the final conclusion, if this is really from the mouth or the hand of God, I don't know whether God wrote it or whether God gave it to Adam and Adam wrote it, or maybe God gave it to Adam, Adam memorized it verbatim, and then uh, they wrote it after the flood when we started having uh, writing. But in whatever case, whatever the case is, that means that Genesis 1 is the most authoritative part of Genesis. And in fact, with the words of Jesus, and the Ten Commandments is the most authoritative part of the Bible itself. That's something to think about. Um, and with that, I will open the floor for questions and comments. I have one over here. Does the author or the documentary hypothesis folk recognize that Job was the first book written, not Genesis? That's an interesting point. Job has a lot of very ancient references. But the people who favored the documentary hypothesis mostly put Job late because Job has a resurrection in it. And the resurrection wasn't thought of until way late. And that gives you an idea of the mindset of the people who are making this up. You see, the Hebrew religion to them has to develop slowly from primitive roots. Uh, God is at first just our God among many. And then he becomes the supreme God 
and then he becomes the only God. And then finally, he doesn't just care about this life, there's a future life because this life isn't, uh, people don't get what they deserve in this life. And, and, and if you assume that you know how the theology developed, well then you can take the book and you can say, well this part's obviously early, this part's obviously late. And of course, then you get into people arguing, well does this part really talk about resurrection or not? And um, when one person will argue, no it doesn't and therefore it could be early, and the other person will argue, no, yes it does and therefore it must be late. And this as you can imagine, there becomes a kind of a general consensus, but a whole bunch of confusion as to exactly where the borders are. And as time goes on, it gets more and more confusing. And then what really throws monkey wrenches in there is when you find out that things that were always assumed to be priestly, for example, the Lord bless you and keep you, the Lord make his face shine upon you, the Lord be gracious unto you and give you peace. We find them in pre-exilic Hebrew script uh, in Jerusalem in, on, a, on a little silver band that goes around the, uh, around the wrist. You, you know, you're supposed to bind these words up and put them around your wrists and on your doorposts and that's one of the ways you do it if you're a good Jew. And they, they, they're still, really orthodox Jews still have those. Um, and, and so here's something that uh, is clearly pre-exilic. And so then, uh, then there's a scramble to say, well, actually what happened was that the priestly blessing itself was old, but it got incorporated into a newer uh, uh, document. Whereas some other people will say, well, no, actually the document was old. And I think that the consensus is starting to lean towards, well, you know, the priestly code must go back at least to Hezekiah. And that way they escape the problem of that particular blessing being clearly pre-exilic because we found it in pre-exilic script. Who do they have authoring the book of Job? Like I say, it depends on whether you lean hard on the evidences within the book itself, in which case you somebody way back when. Moses is a good candidate, but um, many of those people think that Moses is a construction anyway. So uh, it's some ancient Hebrew whom we don't know. Um, or whether you lean really hard on, but it has the resurrection, and the resurrection is really late, like in Daniel, which was written in 168 BC, according to them. And so therefore it must be, you know, very late, uh, maybe even post-exilic. <coughs> Just a minute. We want to catch your voice for, Sorry. for posterity here. So, so yes. Go ahead. I'm saying the general consensus. It's not a fact, but we are just accepting. But is there any proof, fact, that Job looks like that Moses was the one? No, there's no proof yeah. that uh, Moses did it. Um, Moses was simply, in all probability, the first really highly literate. Uh, Hebrew. Uh, um, not to say that, uh, that other people couldn't have read or written, but to say that, uh, that he was trained in Egyptian and uh, he probably, uh, uh, well, he certainly had access to um, uh, proto sinaitic writing, uh, which means that he, it's he would be a really good candidate for writing it. Now, I will say this, that the traditional view, although without a lot of supporting evidence other than what I just stated, has been that Moses wrote Job. I think Ellen White's viewpoint is that way too. Um, proving it would be a lot harder. And I think most people would say, well, whoever wrote it uh, the, the situation is old. And in fact, um, uh, there's some fascinating things coming out, like for example, uh, there are, it looks like there was a river once through Saudi Arabia, which is no longer there. 
and uh, there are people who I have reasonably hypothesized that uh, that uh, that river was probably known uh, to the people who wrote Genesis or the person who wrote Genesis. So it's nice to have a spirit of prophecy. I think so. I, I think it gives us a leg up. Yeah. Uh, we have comments down here. And John. Well, aside from the history, uh, very interesting. I, I was looking a little into doc documentary hypothesis myself. But um, it is nice to have Ellen White because it kind of shows us the nature of how prophecy works. Ellen White claims to have visions of historical events, way including the Garden of Eden, but then she doesn't just write her own words. She uses other people who've written about things that she claims to have seen, and she, com she edits it, right? She makes it her own, and she edits it in a unique manner because she says, hey, these people just said it nicely. I mean, they, they described these events that I saw in a much better way than I could describe it. And so she uses their skill of, of, um, of writing and, and makes it part of her own work. And some people say that's uh, plagiarism, and uh, I guess it depends on how you use it and if you reference it. But, um, but if, you, if you copy one person, it's plagiarism. If you copy many people, it's uh, research, right? So... Anyway, I think she did good research. I'm not uh, completely happy with uh, some of his divisions of the tablets. Uh, tablet 4, I think, what covered the uh, sons of Noah. And it's true they were involved in the flood, but chapters 6, 7, and 8, to I me. Mean, uh, instead of going clear up to chapter 10, I think he does for tablet 4, uh, makes it much more coherent and a uh, uh, topical topic. It's the flood. Uh, and uh, uh, it seems to me that is a much more significant uh, event and, and thing than just, you know, uh, things about the, the uh, sons of Noah. I, uh, I, I'd like to have seen uh, perhaps some other criteria used in, in determining what is one tablet and what is another tablet. Well, I think that the point he's making is that this is the history that the sons of Noah possessed. Yeah, I, I understand that. And so uh, you don't really have a history that the flood possessed because the flood's not a person uh, that can write. I, uh, but I do think the flood was probably a more momentous event than just the sons of Noah. Uh, well, you know, when the sons of Noah describe it, it certainly is a, a, a huge event. Yeah, and he shouldn't stop with Noah at chapter 5. He's, uh, Noah goes through the flood also, you know. Uh, yeah, but see, this is, this is Noah's tablet, and, and, and it's... And then that's where Noah stops. And the interesting thing is the next phrase after this is the tablet of Noah or the, the story of Noah is Noah was a just man and perfect in his generations. It's really hard for me to see Noah writing that about himself. Um, but it's easier for me to see the son saying, you know, dad was one great guy. Uh, we have come in back there. Can we pass the... Oh, uh, you want to speak first? You want to pass that mic up then? Go ahead. It's an uh, interesting note that uh, oral tradition is fairly consistent and, and it's fairly accurate through the years that they've done studies on oral traditions and it seems to me that uh, if I understand you right, it was oral tradition to start out with, and then after the flood it was written. Is that your understanding? I don't really know for sure. It's possible that uh, Moses carried over some written material with him. Uh, Moses, Noah. Um, if he did, he would have to have the, the first Genesis story, uh, 
he would have to have the tablet of Adam, and he would have to have his own tablet. He could have written his own tablet at the end of the flood, and so the only real oral things that have to be kept are the the story of Noah, uh, pardon me, of the story of Adam and the and the story of the creation. Now the thing I think is fascinating is that it takes the strong points of the documentary hypothesis and takes them right out from under it. Because what it says is our, our theory, without having to do any modification, accommodates your complaints about the Genesis record uh, perfectly. This, the tablet of the three sons has two, maybe three perspectives. It's never been separated into more than three, but that's the one tablet that is said to be triply authored, or at least triply owned. Um, the, the, uh, all the other ones are single authors. Um, and it, it does posit a difference between Genesis 1 and Genesis 2. And Genesis 1 is from God's perspective. Genesis 2 is from Adam's perspective. So it makes perfect sense. And uh, those who say, but they're different stories. Well, of course they're different stories. One's from a global perspective, and one is from the perspective of the person who experienced it. And that's why when Adam says when God made the animals and brought them to him, he wasn't really particularly caring exactly when the animals were made compared to him. Uh, God made the animals, definitely. He brought him to him, uh, but this is his own personal centric view that God made the animals and brought him to him. It was, it's interesting that it says that God made the animals and brought him to him instead of saying God made the animals in front of him and then asked him what they were. Adam doesn't really know exactly when God made the animals except for when God said. But what, God, uh, what Adam does know is that God made the animals and then subsequently brought them to him for naming. So it makes, it makes sense out of that part of Genesis. Uh, we had a comment here and then we'll have one over here. Wasn't it the revised standard version that said all inspired scripture is for our, our benefit? perhaps suggesting that there's some of it that wasn't inspired. Um, we have a plethora of authors over hundreds of years composing the Bible. I'm one of those who 40 years ago <laughs> took a class called the, uh, the Bible as Literature. And we looked at poems and different genre of writing. You mentioned that part of it you found boring and yet Genesis was so excelling. If I were God, I think I would have somehow inspired these uh, holy men to use my genre rather than all of this um, confusion. Well, you know, Ellen White writes in a particular style. And for those for whom that style has kind of fallen out of their fashion, they find her... Victorian, I love it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, flowery adjectives, uh, that was the style. It's not the style anymore, and a lot of people read her and go, ah, whatever. You know? Uh, God speaks to the people of the day in the manner in which uh, they are most accustomed. And that's why I said, Leviticus is boring for me. It was fascinating to find out from a, uh, a Jew that uh, for her, the Leviticus was the most interesting part of the entire Pentateuch. Different taste. I'm not here to tell you that my taste is better than hers. Maybe mine is perverted by Western values. You know, what I am here to say is that Genesis 1 does not fit P 
and yet they've been forced to put it there because of the theology. And that means I think there's something basically wrong with the whole process. Uh, are there here. pictures of these tablets and in what language were they written? That's an interesting question. The Jews will say they were written in Hebrew because that was the original language. Now, is that culture-centric or is that really the truth? I don't know. I guess someday we'll find out. Uh, maybe the original language is really old Babylonian uh, or Akkadian. I do know this, that the people who do these things will tell me that Sumerian is totally different from Akkadian and that if you're trying to pull roots out of Sumerian, the closest roots come out of Chinese. Um, but it's different enough from Chinese that it's hard to really make a clear uh, distinction there. Um, but that... Uh, that Akkadian is very closely related to Hebrew. And it could very well be that Akkadian, the old Babylonian dialect, is, was the original. Um, but we're not likely to be able to find out for uh, the uh, foreseeable future. And it, I think that's one of those questions you'll have to ask God when we get to the new earth. So where are the tablets, though? Uh, now, to be fair, this guy's hypothesis is every bit as hypothetical in that regard as the standard documentary hypothesis. There are no tablets out there that we know of that correspond to, say, Genesis 1. All we're doing is we're looking at the way it's been written now and saying this looks like a colophon. This is the tablet or whatever. And therefore, it makes sense to try to say, well, maybe there were tablets. So it's Joseph Smith all over again. <laughs> Pardon me? Joseph Smith all over again. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, the interesting thing is this same technique was applied in two other places that are fascinating. One of them is the Isidorian Decretals, where... Um, they uh, established that they were forgeries uh, and that the papacy didn't really have the rights that was claimed from those. The, and of course, now, see, the papacy will come back and say, now, look, you're, you're trashing those people over the Bible. Why are you trashing them over the Isidorian Decretals? So, you know, uh, if you're going to do this, you have to go back and revisit those decretals and see if the reasons that were given for them being frauds really stands up. But the other place that is fascinating is the Homeric legends. There were people who got all kinds of sources in Homer and said that it was written late and so forth and that Troy was just a myth. And of course that one has kind of been blown to smithereens by the disco discovery of Troy itself. So um, uh, there, there's still a few pieces of dust that need to settle on that one. Uh, but it's pretty well ex accepted that the method as applied to Homer failed. And so it's not unreasonable to say, well, if it failed in Homer, maybe it's failed in the Bible too. Now, I don't expect to see a, an objective argument on this. And the reason I don't is because for some people you can't have Moses writing Genesis because if he did, he wrote Exodus. If he wrote Exodus and Genesis, uh, then he's an eyewitness to the Exodus. You can't write the Exodus off as a, as a um, I mean, the facts are just too, too difficult to explain under naturalistic presuppositions without putting a lot of distance between and fogging the memory and that kind of stuff. 
see. And if you're explaining the naturalistic, if you're trying to explain it naturalistically, it's much more convenient to have something that that. Uh, uh, <laughs> much more convenient to have as something that uh, will explain uh, away miracles. And so therefore you want lots of time, you want lots of uh, oral tradition where things got kind of exaggerated and so forth between when Moses actually led the children of Israel or perhaps somebody did and, uh, and, uh, and when it was finally written down. Because once it's written down you're kind of stuck with the story. So it's nice to have the story written down, uh, say, just before the exile, during the time of Hezekiah, something like that. That's the motive for bringing it down. And like I say, for these people, that particular motive is actually a, a feature, not a bug. They like it. And that's why you're not going to see a purely objective discussion of this because there are too many implications. They get too close to some people. Well, for me, I mean, that's a valid question. Is the, are we just believing in golden tablets like the Book of Mormon? And uh, you have to ask yourself that question and say, hey, why do we believe that the Bible is true and the Book of Mormon isn't? Because we, we don't have the original tablets either way. right? So why, why then is the Bible historical? And you have to look, at, I think, at the internal claims from each book, from any claim that says, oh, this is from God. Well, how do we know that? Uh, what evidence is there? And you have to look at the internal claims. Um, and it comes down to, um, for me, statements about testable reality, empirical reality. Is the Bible testable? Is it verifiable in what it claims happened that we can actually evaluate? And is the same true for the Book of Mormon. And for example, the Book of Mormon claims that the American Indians are descended from the lost tribes of Israel. Well, we know that they're, they're Asian in origin, not, from, not Jewish at all. So that, to me, that undermines the credibility of the Book of Mormon from being from these golden tablets. Whereas the Bible, it, this is the reason why I think Wal Houston and, the, and these guys, they don't believe in, in the historical validity of, of Genesis because they believe in evolution. If you establish evolution as true and valid, that life has evolved over billions of years of time, it significantly undermines your one's view, I would think, most people, most rational people's view of the credibility of the Bible with regard to any of the medical, metaphysical statements it makes. And so if you look at, the, at life and say, hey, life cannot have evolved over billions of years of time, it has, the evidence is actually quite convincing that it's recent, uh, it's actually devolving over time, uh, and that there's certain features of complexity of life that cannot be produced by any known naturalistic mechanism that have to have been designed, that adds to the credibility of the Bible and undermines Wal Hewson and, and the whole purpose of the documentary hypothesis. Mm -hmm. Bellhausen. Bellhausen. Sorry, yeah. my German is well. Now, before we go on, I need to point out that it's a little past 11.30, and I know some of you uh, need to be elsewhere, but uh, uh, we'll carry on the conversation for a little bit longer uh, for those of you who can stay. Historicity, you know, people with long, good memories, perfect recollection, being handed down, and no written record. Well, it's possible that Adam's story was memorized by Adam, told to Methuselah, told to Shem, and then Shem wrote it down verbatim once they got through the flood. And that's only three people that it has to pass through, so it's not like. It's not like today's oral memories. I understand, yeah. yeah. The other thing is when, when you look at the book of Job, if you read it casually, it's about Job's sufferings. But if you read it with insight, it's about the councils in heaven 
and the whole conflict that's yes, involved. Yes, and that's late theology, so therefore it must be a late book. It looks like we're just about done in this. Uh, Ariel has something. No. So uh, we'll see you all next week then.